Okay, ready. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome this afternoon to our Brexit Institute seminar, where we'll discuss beyond the transition period, uh, beyond the transition period indeed, uh, as we approach the transition period. It's wonderful to see so many people here with us in the room this afternoon. Uh, I'd especially like to welcome our Minister for State for European Affairs, Mr. Thomas Byrne, uh, who's joined us. Uh, I appreciate the engagement uh, of a government minister with us uh, in the seminar this afternoon at such a, a busy time uh, for the government, and uh, we're very grateful to you for being with us. Um, today's discussion is well-timed as we come to the end uh, of this transition period. Um, it is a cliché, and... Um, the beauty course about cliches is usually they capture elements of the truth, but we are at, at a crossroads uh, in the Brexit process when we are forced again to make a choice. And it, it is very clear, and the media reportage in the last few days uh, have indicated to us that the, the stakes couldn't be higher for both the Europe and the United Kingdom, and particularly, particularly for Ireland, given our historic and close relationship with the United Kingdom and, of course, our uh, membership of the European Union. Um, I'm pleased that the Brexit Institute is hosting and facilitating this important work that under Federico's uh, leadership, the DCU was the first university in Europe to establish an institute which focused on the United Kingdom's departure from the EU. And even after Brexit, uh, this institute will, uh, Brexit will have long-term consequences and the Brexit Institute will continue this uh, important work, uh, important work of engagement and facilitation. Uh, I think it was uh, Erasmus who said, uh, give, give light and darkness will disappear to itself. And hopefully today's uh, seminar will uh, at least kind of illuminate or enlighten the, uh, what lies ahead of us in the post-transition period. We have a very distinguished panel that uh, our chair, Shona Murray, will introduce in greater detail. Uh, and I'd like to thank them sincerely for being with us this afternoon. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity too to boast uh, about our university, uh, but especially of the Brexit Institute and the achievement of the Brexit Institute, which is um, centred in the School of Law and Government in the Faculty uh, of Humanities at Dublin City University. Um, the past 12 months has been a very busy period for Federico and his colleagues. They've developed um, the Bridge Project, which is a, an EU-funded academic network that assesses EU governance and responses to the European crisis. Uh, last month, the Bridge Project launched a new MOOC um, entitled The EU from Crisis to Recovery. Uh, I'd invite you to uh, engage with that and investigate it. And I'd also like to thank the Minister and his department, the Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, which funded the MOOC um, under the Communicating Europe initiative of the uh, Irish government. Uh, the Brexit Institute also received uh, additional funding recently for a Jean Manet project in, called Relay, which is led by our colleagues in the University of Maastricht. Uh, and the Brexit Institute is a key player in shaping a domestic policy in Europe. Uh, and for instance, that Federico recently contributed to the Iraqis Joint Committee uh, that's the uh, Irish Parliament's Joint Committee on European Affairs in their discussion about the Conference on the Future of Europe. Uh, it's also worth noting the recent publication of the Institute, uh, Law and Politics of Brexit, Volume 2, which focuses on the withdrawal agreement um, published by Oxford University Press. The preface is written by uh, Michel Barnier. Um, and of course, no, no event would be uh, possible without the generosity of our sponsors. And I would like to thank uh, our colleagues in uh, Allied Irish Banks, uh, Grant Thornton and GSK Stockman in Luxembourg. I'd also like to thank Federico and Catherine and everybody for putting today's seminar in place. So without any more ado, I'd like to hand you over to uh, our distinguished chair, Ms. Uh, Shona Murray. So Shona, thank you. 
Thanks very much uh, for that, Dara. Um, welcome to everyone this afternoon. I might just hand over straight away to Minister Thomas Byrne, Minister for State for the EU Affairs, just, just to hear what he has to tell us about where we're at now with the negotiations. Minister. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Shona, uh, and thanks very much, uh, President Dara Kyo. Just to wish you, uh, uh, Dara, the very best uh, in your tenure. You just started as President uh, this year, and I had many successful engagements with your predecessor, Brian McCrath, who has now gone on to do uh, even more important work uh, in, in terms of the COVID as well in this, in this country. And I really want to thank uh, the entire contribution of the ECU uh, to national progress. I think it's, I think it's very important and I, I wish you the best. And to thank you very much, uh, Federico and Shona, for having me uh, on this panel today. Uh, I'm very happy to have the uh, opportunity uh, to speak to you all at what is, as has been for many months, a critical juncture in the Brexit uh, negotiating process. Um, and I suppose I'll give an update on, on the three main streams of work that the government is involved in with regard to Brexit, that's okay. Obviously, we have the future uh, partnership negotiations, which are ongoing between the EU and the UK, as you know, and uh, the implementation then of the uh, protocol on Ireland and, and Northern Ireland, and indeed our own readiness then uh, for the end of the transition period. Now, as you know, the negotiations between the EU and the UK are taking place uh, daily across many negotiating tables, not just the ones that are uh, spoken of uh, in the media regularly and are known to be difficult issues. But we are in a decisive uh, phase, but there really is very little time left. Due, of course, to uh, one of the negotiating team falling ill with COVID-19, uh, talks uh, were temporarily suspended last week. Uh, the talks have resumed and the negotiating teams are continuing their work. A brief update was given by President von der Leyen at a video conference of EU leaders on the 19th of November. The following day, she observed that recent Days had seen movement uh, at that time on some key issues, including state aid, but further work needed to be done to close gaps. And the negotiating teams uh, are now focusing on the key outstanding issues. And they remain, as many of you will know, fair and open competition, crucial uh, for jobs in this country, governance uh, to regulate that, and fisheries, which is a sensitive issue for a number of EU member states, including Ireland. So progress on these issues is crucial uh, to unlocking a deal. Ireland and EU, our EU partners want a free trade, with the, uh, free trade deal with the UK, clearly, but it can't come at any price. We can't uh, accept proposals which impact on the integrity of the single market, or indeed will damage the long-term political or economic interests of the European Union. Throughout the process, we've worked closely with the EU Task Force uh, and Michel Barnier. From the start, Mr Barnier has been a good friend to Ireland, and that goes back many years to his time as a commissioner, when he was actually... Uh, the Commissioner responsible for setting up the, the peace programme of funding, which continues in the new um, uh, financial framework. He's acutely aware of our concerns, says it publicly all the time, uh, and knows that Ireland continues to fully support his work. I've had a series of bilateral calls with my counterparts across Europe over the last number of weeks. They're very positive calls. Our European partners are extremely well aware of Ireland's position on Brexit, and as a new minister coming into the job, uh, maybe four or five months at this point, that's extremely encouraging to, to know that colleagues uh, and, and, and are interested, but also at the level of detail uh, on, on the issues too. They see the central importance of the with, uh, implementation of the withdrawal agreement, particularly the protocol, of course, and, and their solidarity is robust uh, and universal. So the work on implementing the withdrawal agreement is formally separate, obviously, to that on the future relationship. And of course, the withdrawal agreement is designed to operate regardless of whether there's a separate trade agreement. Or not. We want to see maximum progress though on both. We remain committed to building a future relationship with the United Kingdom, but it can only be on the basis of trust and confidence that the withdrawal agreement itself has been fully implemented. Uh, the protocol is a central component of the withdrawal agreement and, as I said, is explicitly designed to operate regardless of the outcome of the, the trade talks. It's expressly devised to provide stability and certainty on the island of Ireland regardless uh, of the wider circumstances. The protocol protects uh, the Good Friday Agreement, North-South cooperation and the all-island economy. It avoids a hard border on the island of Ireland, that will not happen. Um, but it does also, at the same time, and this is a key priority for us and our, our European colleagues, it preserves the integrity uh, of the EU central market and then for us, our place in it. Uh, it ensures also for Northern Ireland, I think this is exciting for Northern Ireland, it ensures their, their goods access uh, to the single market uh, and that trading goods will flow, flow freely on this island. It's vital that the protocol is now fully and faithfully uh, implemented as already agreed. You will also be aware of the UK's internal market bill and how certain provisions of this bill 
uh, if implemented, would impact on the protocol. Uh, it is our view and that of our EU partners and very strongly of the European Parliament that the offending provisions uh, need to be removed or in other words, not inserted back on the, on the bill, but back to the House of Commons. They've, they've, they've been withdrawn in the House of Lords. The withdrawal agreement provides the structure for handling issues around the implementation of the withdrawal agreement of the protocol. This is the only appropriate way to deal with outstanding questions. Intensive contacts at technical level between the EU and the UK have already borne fruit around some key issues such as medicines and the single electricity market. The same structures also provide the means for exploring practical solutions to other concerns such as those regarding supermarket supply chains in Northern Ireland. We're acutely conscious of the sensitive nature and critical importance of all these issues. But I'm confident that we'll be able to find and implement solutions that work for people and businesses in Northern Ireland. So we're in close contact with Commission Vice President Shevkovic, who is the EU co-chair of the Joint Committee overseeing the implementation of the withdrawal agreement. Ireland participates at senior official level as part of the EU delegation in meetings of the Joint Committee and the Specialised Committee on the implementation of the withdrawal agreement and the protocol. The Joint Committee indeed is meeting tomorrow to bring forward its work. The third strand of our Brexit working government is our preparations for the end of the transition period on the 31st of December. So no matter what happens in the talks, and this is our, our key message, the end of the transition period will bring substantial and lasting change and action must be taken now by those affected. There will not be extra time in this particular uh, match. And any business that moves goods from, to or through Great Britain, the island of Great Britain, will be subject to a range of customs formalities SBS checks and other regulatory requirements that do not apply today. Even with a deal, the seamless trade that we're used to will not continue. So on the 9th of September, the government launched its Brexit Readiness Action Plan. The plan sets out the actions the government will take and that businesses and citizens must take to address the changes that will arise at the end of the transition period. The implementation of that plan is underway. It's been led by government, but requires everybody uh, to buy into it and to, to do what they need to do to prepare. Budget, Budget 2021 allocates unprecedented resources to confronting the twin challenges of COVID-19 and Brexit, with 340 million euros to be spent on Brexit-related measures. The Brexit Omnibus Bill completed committee in remaining stages in the Dáil this week. It's going to the Shannon next week. Uh, the bill is designed, obviously, to protect citizens, consumers and businesses to reduce the possibility of serious economic disturbances and to facilitate the sound functioning of a, key number, a number of key sectors. It also contains provisions to uh, support the common travel area and north-south cooperation. Many aspects of our relationship with our nearest neighbour will change fundamentally. The government remains committed to protecting and strengthening the Ireland-UK relationship following the end of the transition. The strong partnership that exists and indeed needs to exist between Ireland and the UK as co-guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement, as close neighbours and economic partners, needs to continue and needs to endure. We will have to work together in new ways to ensure a, a strong and thriving partnership into the future. But Ireland's place is at the heart of Europe. The EU is a home we have helped build. The steadfast support of our Euro European partners has been central to ensuring that our interests are protected in the Brexit process. Their support gives us strength. Nowhere has that been more evident than in the support of the EU27 for the protocol uh, on Ireland, Northern Ireland, which protects gains uh, made in the peace process. And indeed, uh, the week after next, my, my French counterpart, Clément Bon will be visiting Ireland and has specifically requested to visit the border. So that interest remains, and he's really following a, a well-worn path of, of uh, European leaders coming to see what the border is like uh, in reality. And that's very, very encouraging. That interest is still there and still strong. As we look beyond the end of the transition period at the end of this year, we turn towards the Conference on the Future of Europe and our place in the Union. There are many daunting challenges currently facing the EU. Less than a year ago, all of our major preoccupations in, in Ireland uh, uh, were, were, were Brexit related. Now Brexit still looms large, um, but for much of this year, it's been overshadowed by the COVID crisis. But the common thread in Brexit, the COVID-19 crisis and other crises we face is that the EU's future will be determined by the strength of its response, solidarity among member states and recovery. I'm confident the EU and its member states will continue to work together to respond to these challenges. We believe that the priorities of the EU should remain closely aligned to the priorities identified in the European Council's strategic agenda. However, COVID-19 means that the mechanisms and timeframes for achieving these priorities will require additional flexibility as we work to ensure that all member states achieve a full recovery together. 
The recovery should be built on the foundations of our long health priorities, ensuring the single market is fit for the digital age, finding solutions to climate change, uh, combating protectionism, promoting free trade, preparing for social and economic challenges of the digital transformation, and developing greater dialogue between the EU and Africa. So the Conference on the Future of Europe will provide a useful opportunity to consider the challenges we face and our policy priorities. But we can't recover from the crisis without the support and the trust of our citizens. The conference provides a forum um, for us to build and re uh, take back that trust, uh, but to ensure that policies and strategies reflect uh, the needs and concerns of citizens. So we believe that the focus should be on citizens, their views, their informed views, but on policy issues, not institutional issues and mechanisms. We don't need to discuss, in our view, processes and procedures. We need real action on the issue. And just the, the update on, on, on everything, though, is that the German presidency is current of, of, of the council is currently negotiating a joint declaration with the parliament and commission that will establish details as to the governance of, and modalities of the conference. I look forward to that. It has undoubtedly been delayed because of the COVID crisis, but it will provide a solid foundation for a conference based on the exclusion of citizens and, and a prioritization of the issues that matter most to them. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for that, Minister. A very comprehensive uh, assessment of where we're at now and really what's ahead of us. It's actually quite daunting. And as Dara said, there's so much at stake. Just before I introduce the panel, though, we're kind of all at the edge of our seats here, Minister. So I'm going to ask you just, is there any update? I mean, we heard on Friday, for example, that 95% of the negotiations is complete, but the 5% outstanding is, of course, greater than the sum of its parts, level playing field, fisheries and governance. You know, has anything moved, let's say, since Friday, since we heard on Friday that, you know, the EU wants to have a specific governance retaliation clauses on level playing field? And of course, we know that since March, there's been no progress on fish. So what has happened in the last week? Please, well, talks are continuing and have restarted after the, the COVID interruption. So I think that that's, that's good news. But look, it's not really my place to conduct the negotiations or to give a running commentary on them. And we've, we've given a commitment that we won't do that. But what we've done is we've, we, as Europeans here in Ireland, have put our faith in the European negotiating team of Michel Barnier. Uh, and he is under no illusions and, and knows full well uh, what our priorities are. But I have to say, I think uh, that the European Union has shown uh, willingness to move, willingness to compromise, to get a deal done that would benefit everybody. That's the, the art of negotiation. Um, but I think it remains to be seen what exactly are uh, the plans of the British, in particular for Prime Minister Boris Johnson. I think it's fair to say that we don't know that. Uh, and many times they seem to be avoiding the issues themselves in, in public commentary. So, so that presents a difficulty. But I think if we don't get a deal, um, it would be very damaging for Ireland. It would be damaging mm. for Ireland, for the European Union. But I think it would be devastating for for. for, for Britain, and we're already seeing signs of that in some of the preparations that they are doing in terms of traffic, for example, which is only uh, a small part of the damage that would be done in terms of traffic. Yeah. Mm. And you're hopeful, though, I mean, you keep talking and hopefully something will materialise because I suppose it has to. I mean, the cost well, of well, faith is high. Well, I mean, I know people give out about politicians in Ireland, but I mean, generally speaking, in Ireland, you know, when we're negotiating or we're doing something as politicians, no matter what party, we aren't trying to look out for the best interests of our citizens, whether that's social or economic. Yeah. And it seems to me that the best social and economic out outcome for Britain from, from these negotiations would be to have an agreement. It would be far superior, and all of the research and evidence shows this, to a no deal. So on that basis, I would have to think that British leaders would be thinking the same vein as we would be thinking, that this is in the best interest of the citizens to conclude this. But time is running short. There, there will not be an extension. Uh, that has been made clear time and time again. It's not possible. I think we'll talk to our panel about uh, certain aspects of that, in particular the legal perspective um, in relation to the transition extending. We, we, I know we can't extend it, but what could happen in terms of a bridging situation? But anyway, let me, let me introduce our, our panel without further ado. It's Vernon Bogdanner, who's Professor of Comparative Government at King's College. Um, John Doyle, Dean of DCU Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. Federica Fabrini, Director, of course, at the Brexit Institute. And Louise Kelly, partner of Grant Thornton in Belfast. Uh, Federico, I might just start with you. Um, if you want to give your five to seven minutes, and then each panelist will, will speak for five to seven minutes, and then we'll get into the bit of the discussion. I know, Minister, that you can't stay for the full hour, but, so we'll come back to you straight after. Thanks a million. Federico, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks a lot, Shona, for uh, introducing me and giving me the floor. And let me obviously take the opportunity to, to thank warmly uh, Minister Thomas Byrne for uh, being with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, I do want to share. 
my thoughts with you on the topic of today's conference. And I will also share my screen uh, because I have prepared a couple of PowerPoints. So I think people should be able to um, see my screen now. Uh, and I'm gonna speak for the next uh, six minutes really about Brexit and the future of, uh, of Europe, giving you my thoughts on, uh, on the topic. Uh, and I will do so by starting off uh, from uh, a book I've just uh, written and it's going to be published by Oxford University Press next Friday entitled Brexit and the Future of European Union, uh, the Case for Constitutional Reform. And this is a uh, work that collects uh, my thoughts since I won the Charlemagne Prize Fellowship uh, exactly a year ago in November uh, 2019. Now, it, in this work of mine, what I basically endeavored to do is to use Brexit as a prism uh, to think about uh, Europe. And so essentially the structure of the volume as well as uh, the structure of my uh, brief presentation this afternoon uh, uses Brexit uh, to think about uh, the state of the European Union. First of all, during Brexit, uh, secondly, besides Brexit, thirdly, beyond Brexit, and finally, after Brexit. And so I will try to uh, conclude with some uh, last thoughts which are really focusing uh, on the conference on uh, the future of Europe. Uh, I'll be brief on each of this, uh, but let me start with, uh, with the first part. Uh, so if we look back at uh, the state of the European Union uh, during the Brexit process, I think it is fair to emphasize that the European Union has shown uh, a remarkable level of unity. Uh, this has been noticed by, uh, by many, the EU institutions and the 27 stick together, uh, including defending the interests uh, of, uh, of Ireland. Now, obviously Brexit did have a lot of transitional, uh, did create a lot of transitional challenges uh, for the uh, European Union, and I discussed some of them uh, in my own and uh, prior work. Uh, nevertheless, I think, you know, the fears that, uh, that many had that Brexit could be the beginning of disintegration in Europe did not materialize uh, at all, uh, uh, quite, uh, quite the opposite. In fact, what we've seen uh, in, uh, uh, in the years of the Brexit process is the emergence of the EU27 as a new reality uh, within the European Union. And in that framework, uh, we've also seen uh, the start of a debate on uh, the future of Europe, uh, which is really a conversation about where we would like the European Union to be uh, after, uh, after Brexit. Now, this is on the positive side, but if we move uh, besides Brexit, what I think it is fair to say is that uh, the last decade has been a decade of crisis for uh, the European Union. Uh, Europe has gone through the Euro crisis first and the migration crisis. We have a serious problem of rule of law crisis uh, in some member states. And the explosion of the COVID pandemic uh, is just a ter the cherry on, on top of the pie that has made uh, things uh, quite complicated for the European Union by exposing, I would argue, uh, multiple cleavages among uh, the member states. And in my opinion, uh, the difficulties the uh, European Union had in, uh, um, in resolving once and for all uh, the crisis it faced in the last decade uh, very much have to do with the emergence of competing visions on uh, the future of Europe. And uh, reducing this uh, to uh, sort of putting that in a nutshell, I think there are three uh, ever stronger competing visions or alternative perspectives on the future of Europe, what I call a polity, a market, and an autocracy vision of Europe. Now, a polity vision of Europe is one that believes that we are, if you will, a community of destiny, that we need to support each other, that we sink or swim together uh, as member state in, in one union. Uh, and that entails a lot of consequences as far as policy responses to crisis uh, is concerned. But this vision competes with a different vision, what I call a market vision of Europe, uh, which instead sees Europe mostly as an economic enterprise. And therefore, that does not require a huge deal of interstate solidarity unless this is necessary to increase the common uh, welfare. Uh, and yet, this second vision is uh, contested by an emerging third vision, what I call an autocracy vision, which instead sees Europe basically as an instrument to entrench uh, backsliding of democracy at the state level. Uh, Europe is essential in this third project uh, because it provides resources through which uh, governments at national level uh, can uh, reduce uh, democracy and the rule of law. And we've seen how damaging uh, that trend is just in the last few weeks uh, with Hungary's and Poland veto on the next uh, MFF, precisely because it included uh, rule of law conditionality, which seemed unacceptable to those two uh, member states. 
So if we take stock of this reality, I think moving forward, the need for reform, the case for reforming uh, the European Union uh, is strong. And I think if the next generation EU becomes a reality, as I'm sure many of us uh, hope, then in fact, the need for reform will be even farther increased. Uh, and uh, therefore on this note, uh, I am of the view that actually the prospect for the European Union moving ahead is to uh, look quite deeply uh, in its own governance structure and try to see what doesn't work uh, within it. Now, talking about reforms ain't easy in the European Union. Uh, as an EU lawyer, I keep saying that to my students as well. Changing the treaties is uh, very complicated, and we know that because of Article 48, which requires unanimity uh, by all member states and their parliaments or peoples uh, in any effort to uh, reform the treaties. Nevertheless, what we do know also is that recently the European Union has developed alternatives to reform itself, and particularly in the context of uh, uh, the euro crisis, uh, EMU, Europe's Economic and Monetary Union, has been reformed uh, through new treaties done outside the normal framework of the European Union. And that, in fact, I think provides an opportunity, an opportunity which I would argue should be taken into account uh, by policymakers uh, involved in the conference on uh, the future of Europe. So what about the EU after Brexit? Uh, and what comes next. Now, Minister Byrne has uh, touched on this. We are at a stage where we are awaiting a joint declaration by Parliament, Commission and Council that will launch uh, the uh, Conference on the Future of Europe. That has been delayed due to COVID, but hopefully it will come soon. And this conference, if you think about it, is an out-of-the-box initiative. Obviously, it's not uh, foreseen in any uh, EU treaty. Uh, so it is similar to several precedents like the Messina Conference or the Convention on the Future of Europe, which where in their ways, uh, out of the box initiatives, which actually played a big role in uh, reforming the European Union and relaunching it at critical time. So I think the prospects for this could be potentially very uh, significant. But if I can just conclude with a note, the idea of a conference on the future of Europe that involves citizens is something which to the Irish mind can be easily related because of the experience that we have had uh, domestically uh, with citizens conventions and the like. And so I've made that point actually to the Oireachtas a few days ago. I think for Ireland, that's actually a big opportunity uh, moving forward uh, in playing a big role in uh, the new European Union, which is emerging uh, after Brexit. So at the end of the day, there might be some interesting potential uh, for, uh, for the country uh, despite many challenges also ahead. And I will just conclude by saying that obviously the Brexit Institute will be there and will be happy to uh, support as we move ahead, uh, not least by leading also a Jean Monnet network uh, bridge on uh, the future of Europe. So I'll stop here and I look forward to further discussions during the Q&A. Federico, thank you very much. The Brexit Institute here to stay, of course. Uh, Vernon, uh, Professor Bogdan, I'll go to you next, please. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, and it's very generous of uh, DCU to invite a mere Englishman to talk. Uh, you may think it's impertinent for an Englishman to talk about the European Union when we've <laughs> caused so much trouble to the European Union, and perhaps particularly to Ireland and Northern Ireland. But perhaps I can get a little bit of credit to say that I actually voted against Brexit. Um, I think I'm invited because of my recent book, uh, which was reviewed very kindly and generously by the Irish Minister of Finance in the Irish Times called Britain and Europe in a Troubled World. It's based on lectures I gave at Yale University last year. Now, the minister, uh, Mr. Byrne, who spoke, is obviously right that it would be best for Britain to get a trade deal rather than not get a trade deal. Uh, it's not fully, I think, understood in Britain because until January the 1st, it's been Brexit in name only. Brexit doesn't kick in until January the 1st. And frankly, although I think it's a good idea to get a trade deal, I'm more worried about the fact that we will be outside the internal market. Now, today, it's as easy to send goods from London to Paris, Berlin, Dublin or Belfast as it is to send goods from London to Edinburgh. That will not be the case after January the 1st. And the sorts of problems we are likely to face could be similar to those that occur on the border between Bulgaria and Turkey, because Turkey in fact in the EU customs union, but not in the internal market. And because of the documentation 
there is every day huge queues of Turkish lorries at the Bulgarian border, which are required to carry all sorts of documents. I don't know whether that can be modified by a, a trade agreement, but I think that is actually more important than the tariffs, and EU tariffs on the whole fairly low. I think the internal uh, market is much more important, and it's the last thing Britain needs on top of COVID. But of course, there's a specific problem with Northern Ireland with the protocol, sometimes called the Northern Ireland Protocol, the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, I think precisely, which I think is slightly deceptive, at least on the British side, because we are told that we are leaving the customs union and that Northern Ireland leaves with us. But in fact, EU customs law will continue to apply in Northern Ireland. And whereas the protocol says that West-East trade will be unfettered, it doesn't say that East-West trade will be unfettered. There will be duties and checks. And of course, there'll be regulatory checks because Northern Ireland will remain in the EU internal market. So there'll be in effect a border in the IRC, all uh, of course subject to the consent mechanism, but subject to that, Northern Ireland remains part of the EU for most purposes. I think many people in Britain haven't uh, yet accepted that point or grasped it. it I say some have maybe negotiated away in the free trade agreement. Uh, there's also a problem, I think, with Article 6 of the Act of Union of 1800, which of course still applies in Northern Ireland, because that says that Northern Ireland, that Ireland, it was then, now it's Northern Ireland, should be treated on exactly the same footing as the rest of the United Kingdom, particularly in terms of customs duties. I know it should be a single market. It's not going to be a single market. So that's the first point I want to make about, rather parochial perhaps, about Britain. But the second point I want to make, and here, if I may dare, I do want to slightly disagree with what the minister has said about the conference on the future of Europe. Now it's true that past crises in Europe have led to further integration almost always. And here we face, Europe faces at least two crises, migration, COVID, a third one, the East-West division in Europe. But what hasn't been sufficiently noticed is the extent to which the European Union has become detached from popular opinion this was first clear at the time of the Maastricht Treaty in 1992, when to everyone's surprise, France only just supported it by 51 to 49 percent. And that was moderate France, socialist and Christian France, against extreme left and extreme right France. And then France and the Netherlands would not agree to the EU constitution. These are thought to be countries at the very centre of Europe. And Europe is giving rise to a very dangerous cleavage, that of the political class versus the people. And this is the question that the European Union needs to consider. It needs, it needs a conference uh, with more integration. That's the last thing it needs, another Messina conference. It needs to deal with that huge divide, which is very, very dangerous. I think you're signaling, Shona, that I've exceeded my time. And if that is so, I will... No, no, keep going. <laughs> Somebody had... Oh, well, thank you. Sorry, it's not, it's, sorry. It's no, 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 no. That, no, that no, is Go ahead. And uh, it's worth saying that President Macron said shortly after Brexit that he couldn't guarantee there wouldn't be a similar outcome in France. And Donald Tusk, who I think was a wise man, said that what Europe needs is not more Europe, but better Europe, more practical measures that will show people that Europe works, like, for example, in the past, the reduction of airfares. And Mark Rutte, the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, has said complete the digital market, complete the services market. Although Europe talks about free services, if you try and set up as a solicitor in France or in Germany, it won't be as easy as it uh, should be in theory. And um, it's no good, I think, to say, frankly, that the European Parliament can represent people in Europe in the way that national parliaments do. And I suspect even in Ireland, people look to the national parliament rather than the European parliament. Now, Angela Merkel in 2010, in her Bruges lecture, which is as important as Margaret Thatcher's famous one in 1988, though less noticed, said there were two ways of building Europe. And there was, of course, the supranational, but also the intergovernmental. And I think the great danger is when Europe gets out of balance with those two and when it entrenches on national prerogatives, as it's done, I believe, with the euro, which came too early, and secondly, with migration, which has caused very serious problems in Europe. 
And I think Europe needs to become much more of an intergovernmental institution, which means downgrading the commission, as some French Gaullists have said, to become a secretariat of the council, because people don't like a body which is not under the control of um, uh, the electorates in member states making key decisions. I mean, no one had heard of Mr. Juncker before he became the president. And I just want to conclude by saying that this is a Gaullist vision, which is a way Europe can go forward. Paradoxically, it's what most British people have thought about Europe. And it confirms what the great French novelist André Malraux said about de Gaulle, that he was a man of the day before yesterday and of the day after tomorrow. And I think that great Irishman, Eamon de Valera, would have agreed with that because he was a bit of a Gaullist himself. So on that note, I conclude. Fascinating, Vernon. That's really interesting. Really look forward to getting back to some of your points there, in particular around how the EU or Europe is out of step with popular opinion. Um, John Doyle, D uh, Dean of DCU Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, the floor is yours. Yeah, I'd like to um, pick up. I mean, obviously, the immediate focus uh, is on Brexit and COVID, and nobody would be human if that wasn't the immediate focus. But at some stage, we get past the immediacy of Brexit, and hopefully, during the course of the spring and summer, we'll get past the public crisis of COVID. And I think then the agenda for the future of Europe needs to be that broad uh, agenda that, that both Vernon and Federica have talked about. And for me, I think it's probably five key issues, I would say, would be the heart of that debate. I think post-COVID, there will be demand from European publics of all sorts for a more social Europe. I think one of the strengths of the European response to COVID has been its focus uh, on the social level, um, you know, even in terms of practical measures like allowing states to borrow more, to spend more, not to impose a strict regulated regime in the face of people suffering, you know, very significantly through loss of income, loss of jobs, and in many cases, loss of family members. So I think that shift to a, a stronger emphasis on the social, which was always there, um, but probably over the last decade or so, when push came to shove and you had to make a choice between uh, protecting markets and assuming a market response would be adequate and promoting a, a more social division, often inaccurately portrayed as a Germany versus France or UK versus France, which never represented the real debate. Uh, I think there would be a pressure there uh, to emphasise more the role of Europe in responding to citizens' social needs, in particular in the environment and social protection and protection of incomes and potential of employment. And I think that balance, I think, will shift a little bit along the dial. Um, I think rule of law will be a real challenge um, and it will be a challenge in some ways also in the traditional debate between a Eurocentric and a more sovereigntist approach, uh, often characterised as a Gaulist, but within a different way to the way Professor Bogner has phrased it. I mean, until now, the price of membership has been paid on admission and the assumption is once you paid it, then you, that you would sort of, thereafter, there would be no backsliding. It was a linear view of history that people had things to meet on the day they joined. But if you, if you met them on the day you joined, we didn't need to worry thereafter. Um, and it's been all too evident. Um, it raised briefly uh, when the far right came to power in Austria some time back now. Um, but because it moved along quite quickly and the, the far right in Austria sort of disintegrated before reorganizing, and now it looks like they're disintegrating again, Europe didn't really have to grapple with it. We sort of could treat it as a pause. But now there was a, a deep question around you know, how difficult do things need to get in Hungary beyond where they are now before some sort of line is crossed? And yet, how do you do that without dealing, without in some ways unpicking the fundamental issues of state sovereignty and the common commitment to some basic European values? People might disagree where along the spectrum uh, you would put that line, but there needs to be a line somewhere, you know, at some extreme point where actually people say there are consequences if those are in terms of access to European funds or, or schemes in the first instance, needs to certainly be a sliding scale. Um, I, I can see why the council have struggled to deal with this issue because it's almost impossible to deal with, uh, but I think there will be demand to deal with it uh, and circumstances will almost require it uh, over the next year or so. And therefore it, there needs to be some discussion of that rather than waiting for it to happen and then making a decision late at night in Brussels in impossible circumstances where something has to be decided before morning. I think on, on geopolitics and security, how uh, we'll be there, how does Europe see itself uh, in terms of world politics beyond 
uh, its role as, as a large market and a norm setter. Uh, relations with Russia have obviously deteriorated very poorly in the aftermath of Crimea and Ukraine. Um, so trying to deal with both en Russia's energy supplier, Russia's market, and Russia as a big bear on our doorstep. Uh, I think Europe hasn't really dealt with that strategically, has sort of dropped from issue to issue. Uh, and likewise, though, there might be a change in temperament and temperature uh, with President Biden taking over on the 20th of January. Uh, but nonetheless, there still are issues there, the transatlantic relationship, that go well beyond the personality of President Trump and his particular approach to world politics. And certainly there will, um, still are some issues there to deal with. Uh, Brexit, ironically, has seen some of the highest percentages of support for the European project across all of Europe, not least in Ireland. Um, I suppose, in, in many ways, uh, at least as it was perceived from various European capitals, the, the challenges, shall we say no more than that, in London in responding to the uh, negotiations uh, certainly seems to point fairly consistently to a downward dial in the percentage of populations who wanted to leave the European Union. But that doesn't mean that challenge of elite versus public perceptions of the European project isn't there. It mightn't have the immediacy of somebody looking to leave, but there is somewhat of a legitimacy. I don't think I'd go as far as Vernon to say it's, it's central, but I think it is there uh, and it's a serious one. And I think it can be addressed uh, through a focus on the social Europe. I would agree more or less uh, with the prognosis, but I would disagree in terms of where to go from there. Um, my fear of a downgrading of the Commission's role uh, and a return to the Council as preeminent with the Commission pushed back is that it would inevitably lead to a significant increase in power of large states and a decrease in power of smaller states. And the balance of the European project between a broad public, you know, you could write rules in that seem to give away to majority, that seem to preclude it, but the reality is if, it doesn't always happen, of course, but if the large states do happen to have a consensual position that isn't in the interests of the great majority of states, um, that's a real danger for me. And the commission, however imperfect and however it, ill-perceived it is often in the public press, sometimes their own fault and sometimes not. Um, it does provide that balancing role for small states. And I think some means needs to be found to deal with the legitimacy project without uh, unpicking and returning to a large state-led project. And I think some of that, perhaps not all of it, but some of it can be dealt with by a more thorough focus on the issues at hand. And I was pleased to hear the minister's comments that the debate should be on substance. Process is important, but ultimately, most people don't understand it or not that interested. Um, you know, those of us at this level need to worry about the process, but the big European debate needs to be about the substance. Mm -hmm. And if we agree on the substance, then we can find means by which that can be dealt with at a European level. But the, the, the people need to see a debate that's about climate, social protection, employment, migration, security issues, the things that worry them in their day-to-day -day lives and that they have been positive about the European project when they've seen that response in the case of COVID and other emerging, where they've seen the benefit of a scale that Europe can bring to a problem that no country, not even Germany on their own, uh, would be able to do as easy without the benefit of the much larger uh, project that's there. And that finally, then, my, my final comments, one that's not on people's minds at the moment, but inevitably comes into a discussion of the future of Europe, is the question of enlargement and the Eastern Partnership. Uh, the on Finnish business in the Balkans, I think it's not easy, it's not popular. Uh, you know, there's different, there's both a common question across the Western Balkans and also individual problems with each individual application, not least the tensions individually. But I think in some ways it is a non-finished part of the Central European enlargement that does need to be tackled. It's not insurmountable in terms of scale at a European level. And I think a pathway needs to uh, be found to deal with that issue, which points towards both a strengthening of the rule of law, um, but also a prospect that if some of those issues are being addressed in an honest way, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And people are not in a, a turkey situation where you can do whatever the European Union asks for 40, 50 years in a row, but actually it doesn't really fundamentally change the question or the answer. Um, but beyond that, and much more tricky, is to find some way of dealing with the Eastern Partnership beyond the Balkans, uh, Ukraine, Georgia and Turkey uh, in particular. Um, I don't think we need to agree an absolute settled position, but I think we need to have a more strategic approach I agree, at a European level as to how to deal with this sort of outer rim and what is that transition period, uh, given that it seems enlargement is a very unlikely prospect in the immediate terms. So how do you describe 
and define that relationship beyond the Western Balkans. Okay. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. John, a huge amount there to get through. And thanks a million for all that, particularly on the enlargement issue, which isn't really a focus at the moment, but should be. And I suppose that issue of Turkey as well, you know, maybe you could say that Turkey decided to take its own direction away from the Europe too. But um, we'll move on to Louise Kelly. Louise, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shona. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to put up a few slides here, if I can get the technology right. Okay, great. <clears throat> well, as Shona said, my name is Louise Kelly and I'm an audit partner here in Belfast in Grant Thornton. You'll see I've managed to get City Hall um, in the background here in our office. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes giving you a short update on where we are at in Belfast. And um, some of it has already been touched on by Professor Bogdanor. But more importantly, what it's like on the ground here in Northern Ireland and what we are seeing and hearing from businesses here um, in Northern Ireland. So obviously due to our location and history, Brexit and land borders were always going to cause a bit of an issue here. And thankfully, we were given the lifeline um, in this regard by the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, which as noted by Professor Bogdanor, is in place regardless of whether or not there is a free trade agreement between EU and UK. And there are positives and negatives as a result of this for NI businesses. In summary, the NI protocol will mean that we will remain in the EU single market for goods. And obviously the most important factor here for us is that there is harmonization on good standards with the Republic of Ireland and no regulatory checks. However, being in this unique position means that Northern Ireland is part of the UK customs territory, but imposes EU custom duties in some cases and follows EU customs rules. Furthermore, NI, must, NI follows most EU VAT rules in relation to goods, but not services, and services are going to be under the UK VAT regimes. There are therefore specific rules for movement of goods, which are isolated to Northern Ireland, which could potentially bring additional burden to businesses. For example, and there's a lot of um, movement here, three examples on this slide, um, which I know was quite small, you, you may not be able to see it all, but for example, Northern Ireland to, to EU movement is unchanged, but goods from GB to Northern Ireland will require customs documentation now, but as part of that, the origin of those goods needs to be considered for the various documentation. So in summary, it's not going to be simple. And there are a number of trade flows which need to be considered by NI businesses. So what are we seeing on the ground? What are the business conundrums that we're seeing at the minute? Well, at a high level, it is fair to say that there's a lot of uncertainty due to the additional complexities that the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol brings, notwithstanding the positive elements, obviously, that it also brings. And also the fact that there is no deal at present. So the UK government have launched a trader support service to help NI and GB businesses trade with each other to give advice on paperwork, etc., which is a positive. That, however, does not come live until the 21st of December, which is 10 days before the new rules come into place. Most businesses at this stage now have been issued with an EORI number, both in the UK and ROI, but now NI businesses need to register for a specific NI one identified as XI. Staffing has always been flagged as critical in most sectors here and the continuation of the common travel area for Irish and UK citizens is welcome. However, with the new points immigration system, low skill workers will be in short supply and many NI businesses have looked at assisting staff with applying for the EU settlement status. And finally on this slide, if an NI business has a 
subsidiary registered in the Republic of Ireland with UK directors, like many of our groups based in Northern Ireland have. They will no longer be compliant with Irish company law as they will not have EEA resident directors. And at present, with no deal looming, businesses need to prepare for this, which may entail appointing an EEA resident director, putting a non-resident bond in place, or applying for a real continuous certificate with the, the inland revenue. What are the sector specific issues that we see our clients are facing? Well, motor retail, less than two weeks ago, HMRC announced the removal of the VAT margin scheme on used vehicles sourced from GB, which could have a crippling impact on motor retail in NI. The used car market is much larger in NI than the new car market. And there are calls for this now to be looked at and potentially changed. However, one would question what the chances are um, on the basis of timeliness. It was only announced two weeks ago. We certainly didn't see this coming and it has been implemented from the 1st of January. The food sector, NI businesses have multiple labelling checks to undertake to ensure that where the origin of food is in NI, the new labels show the UK NI stamp. Manufacturing businesses supplying the same product to GB and EU will now potentially need separate standard mark testing for both jurisdictions, which is additional costs. And retailers, we feel there is very much a lack of understanding in supply chains regarding the Ireland, Northern Ireland Protocol. And NI businesses are getting standard questionnaires from GB and, and ROI multinationals, which aren't necessarily relevant to the NI arrangements. So at the minute, with so much uncertainty, it's not a particularly pretty picture for NI businesses. There is a real mix, mix of businesses being prepared and those who are holding off on a wait and see approach, which is understandable given the numerous deadlines and no deal cliff edges that businesses have seen over the past few years. Just in the past week, with my clients, I have heard, how can I be Brexit ready if I don't know what I am supposed to do? And I'm afraid I will miss something. I wish we had a succinct list of what we were supposed to have ready. And I think with changes continually happening and the uncertainty around no deal, that it doesn't really help with those decisions. There's definitely a feeling of Brexit fatigue up here. And that is caused mostly by the, the, the empty, the, the deadlines which haven't happened over the last number of years. And on top of that, businesses are in survival mode, both businesses who have performed well during the COVID pandemic and those which are struggling. And with the pandemic on top of the Brexit uncertainty, 2021 will certainly bring significant challenges to NI businesses. Thanks very much, that, very much for that, Louise. Um, Minister, I might just bring you in there because I know that you have to uh, go soon. And so I might just ask you one of the, about one of the points that was made by John and, and Vernon earlier. It's in relation to, I suppose, Ireland and Ireland's position in Europe. Um, you know, we know that Ireland has a very strong, there's a strong, very strong support for the EU in Ireland, but it only may only take something like the rise of the far right who focus all the time on things like immigration or migration. Uh, we also have some politicians who criticise the EU for interfering in Ireland's tax affairs. How does Ireland ensure that Irish people are informed about the substance of what the EU does and, and, and still believe that it's right to stay in the EU. I mean, how do you ensure that, you know, the government and the EU is in lockstep of what Irish people are thinking? The Minister. Yeah, well, I think, I think the most important thing um, from any political body or any politician is that the, the public, the citizens uh, which it serves, uh, need to see results. So I think in Ireland we have, you know, uniquely and unprecedentedly high support for membership of the European Union. Why? Uh, because our citizens have seen the solidarity that EU member states have shown to us in the disaster that is Brexit uh, for us. They've seen that in practical terms. I'm hoping they see that now in the COVID crisis as well, when they see real action by the European Commission at last, because let's be honest, it, it was a shock to all of us, this pandemic. Nobody really knew exactly how to react. The European Union was slow, but it has got us back together. I think if it, if, if it can deliver the vaccine, 
uh, to citizens, that would be a positive result. But more of that uh, into the future. And it's up to us as well to, to sell the strong points that are there. The social uh, Europe was mentioned as well, and that's going to be a priority of, of the Portuguese presidency of coming in the new year, and it's something that we'd be very keen on as well. So I think it's about results. Uh, it's about delivering. It's about citizens being familiar with the personalities, because certainly we don't want uh, you know, the great and the good to come together to tell everybody what they want and need. But I think is, but, but it is important that our citizens know who the great and the good are. And in Ireland, because of Brexit, they do. They know of President Ursula von der Leyen. They know of uh, Michel Barnier, certainly as a negotiator. And uh, they have familiarity with their MEPs, although I take the point from Vernon that they're more familiarity with their, their TDs. Uh, but I think it's about results. And I think, I think we have to work as hard as we can together uh, to get results for citizens that are visible and real. But just there was some, there was a, some, um, you know, market research done recently, and you know, majority of Irish people don't want to see Ireland pay more into the EU budget. For example, they prefer when we were a net benefactor, a beneficiary. Uh, they, if let's say we had taking, if we were taking more migrants and refugees to Ireland, that might be a concern. If, for example, Ireland were to give in to CCCTB and you know, tax harmonisation, I mean, there are other, there are lots of you know bumps in the road ahead that may see that popularity of the EU fall away. And is Ireland ready to sort of speak to the population around that? Um, po possibly uh, not ready uh, uh, to speak to the population if those eventualities were to arise. But we, we need to ensure as best as possible that, that they're dealt with appropriately. Um, the issue of the net contribution, I think, is a really important one because that's we've just turned the corner on that in the last few years and it's just now becoming uh, a matter that is discussed in the doll and right to discuss in the doll. It's important that we question these things. Uh, but I think to counteract that, we have to show the benefits that we get. So our two priorities, obviously, the Good Friday Agreement, it's, it's not something you can monetize, although I'm sure somebody could do it, uh, but the access to the single market and the benefits that that brings is our economic benefits and, and social benefits as well. Uh, but we, we, we need to be able to calculate what the benefit of that is to our citizens, what it means in terms of jobs. That's when we talk about the level playing field. You'll have heard the teacher talking about jobs in Ireland. Uh, so we bring it back to, to what it's about. So that is an important issue, and it's very much the net contribution point is something that is on my agenda. We set up a, um, um, well, we, we activated a committee within government um, on, on engaging with Europe, and one of the key points we'll be looking at would be looking at the discretionary uh, pots of money that would be there in the MFF uh, over the next few years to try and ensure that we maximise what we do get out of it. But, but, but uh, an important part of it is valuing what we get that is not simply cash. Just finding for you to go, Minister, the point about from Louise, and she made she said that the Irish Protocol was a lifeline. But I mean, do we know? Do we have any idea about in terms of communicating with people what type of measures they have to put in place ahead of January first? Because as she said, there many businesses don't know. And you mentioned, you know, there will be customs checks. There's obviously going to be regulatory checks. Um, but can you give even some more of an outline as to how you think the government is ready for this deadline? Well, look, first of all, what I'd say is that I would urge people to look at our website, gov.ie forward slash Brexit. There is a, a range of information there that people are looking at and uh, revenue is written out to businesses. I think we're, we're extremely well prepared from a government point of view. Uh, I think the UK government is not as prepared. And one of the problems that we will have over which we've no control is that we, some of our traders on this side of the Irish Sea don't see the same level of preparedness uh, in Britain. And that's going to present difficulties. Uh, there will be things that would be, and I'm sure, Shona, in your work, you'll be reporting on them and, and so on many others. There will be items that will fall out of this process after the 1st of January that may not have been clear to the general public. Uh, and there will be inconveniences, again, many of which we will have no control over. It will simply be uh, a result of, of Britain, Britain leaving the European Union. Um, and we've seen some of them arise, such as the issue of, of, of the supermarkets in Northern Ireland already. But there are items like that that we will have no control over. So, so all we can say, it's mainly business to get ready. We say also to people as well who are shopping online, uh, it's Black, that American uh, festival is on this weekend, Black Friday. But I mean, if you're shopping online after the 1st of January from shops or stores on the island of Great Britain, things are going to change for you. There will be customs checks depending on the outcome of, of a trade deal. There may well be customs charges. There will be VAT. We don't know what your consumer protection rights will be into the future. So there are changes coming uh, and we try to put as much information as we can uh, online and available to people. And we'll keep repeating the message uh, that changes are coming no matter what happens in the, in the trade negotiations, which we hope are successful. Okay, well, best of luck with the talks, uh, Minister. Thanks for many of your time. Appreciate that. Thank you.
And um, Vernon, I might just go to you. I mean, you're making the point that, look, Brexit isn't an aberration. And, you know, here in Brussels, you do hear that, you, you know, really that, you know, the British, they had, they had a difficult relationship with Europe. That's, that was the issue. It wasn't really us. It was them. They never really fully understood what it was to be in the single market and so on. You know, do you see that this could happen again in Europe? Or and do you think that maybe that is sort of the route we're going, particularly when you look at the likes of Poland and Hungary, who similarly have a very torrid relationship with the EU, although they get a lot more money out of it. Well, could I put a paradoxical point to you that perhaps yeah. Britain and Gaulist France were actually in the vanguard of Europe for this reason, that they appreciated Britain because of her long evolutionary history and France because of her experience of the war, what the sacrifice of sovereignty actually meant in practice. It was very easy for countries which are new democracies to regard the EU as a badge of respectability and democracy. And so of course, we're happy to sacrifice sovereignty, but are they happy when it comes about? For example, Greece with the Euro, Spain with the Euro, Portugal uh, with the Euro, the East European countries on migration, they say, well, wait a minute, we're not that sure. Even Germany on debt sharing, well, actually we don't want to share that. And we um, were well aware of what it actually meant and if I may say so, I just wonder if your question to the minister didn't presuppose that decisions of this sort are made on economic grounds. Now, it's very interesting in the British referendum, the most people believe that leaving the EU would not be economically beneficial, but they still wanted to leave for primordial reasons. They felt they didn't belong. And sure, that should be understood in Ireland, because uh, during the union, everyone in Britain said, well, look, if Ireland becomes independent, it'll be much worse off, you know. And the Irish people said, no, well, we don't care about that. We want to rule ourselves. We don't feel we belong to the United Kingdom. And the same argument in relation to Scotland. British ministers saying, look, you'd be terribly wor much worse off, you know, if you leave the United Kingdom. That argument doesn't hold. The Scots say, or some Scots say, you know, we, don't, we just don't feel we belong. And we've got to, if we want to keep Scotland in the union, which I frankly hope we do, we've got to try and persuade the Scots on an emotional and primordial ground. And that's the reason why you have these revolts against Europe. And they won't be resol resolved by economic measures measures, they'll be resolved by taking into account the needs of a specific member state. Of course, that doesn't apply when states breach the rule of law. That is a common uh, uh, value and it is exemplified by the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which applies to all EU countries uh, and is fundamental, I think. Thanks, Vernon. John, is that um, relevant to Ireland? Do you think that maybe in Ireland, actually, people do feel like we do belong in Europe? We've always, we've had a different experience to the UK. Obviously, we became an independent state alongside the UK when we joined the EU. When we were in the UK, we, we, were, we felt occupied. So it really, that was less comfortable. So do you think that maybe what Vernon's saying is that means that Ireland probably will stay in the EU because we do tend to have that affinity with Europe? Yeah, no, I think that's so. I think, you know, for historic reasons, I think, and if you look back at the debate in 1973, in some ways it was seen as an affirmation of sovereignty. Even when we joined the European Monetary System, I remember the late Brian Lenehan arguing on television that, in fact, to remain pegged to sterling was to abandon a sovereign country and to decide to join the euro was an assertion of sovereignty. Now, you can argue it either way, but certainly there's a comfortable language which brings together our own history and national traditions, which that been entirely consistent uh, with joining the European Union, remaining in it. You need to remember a BBC interview with one of the far right members of the Hungarian government, who was absolutely lambasting the European Union. Everything was awful. Everything was terrible. The European Union was the most awful international construction ever. And the interviewer, I think, in their naivety, rather than as a provocative question, said, um, "Well, do you see Hungary?" leaving the European Union then. And he just looked like he didn't know what the question was. He says, of course not. <laughs> you know, because obviously their uh, interests lay, and particularly, I think, also not just economic, I would agree in that regard, but also in terms of their history, to be perceived to be back in Russia's shadow was certainly not a better alternative to having a problem with Brussels. So I think for Ireland, it is a comfortable relationship. I think also on a human level, um, my own wife's from Liverpool, a sort of Irish background, but you know, our families scattered and friends scattered around England and Wales. And they have, Europe is never we when we meet up socially in a pre-COVID world. Um, remember the time the, EU, the European, um, the Euro being brought in, a close friend who'd be on the left in terms of politics, very much so, 
said, are you sad to lose the pound? And it's just like, I don't think anyone in Ireland felt sad. You know, people had different views. Was it good or bad for the economy? Would it be handy for going on holidays? But I don't think we had that level of them. So for them, losing sterling would have been at that absolute emotional level. And I think for our people, passports back, isn't it? So that's yeah. sort of what dividends of leaving the EU. Whereas I think we both see the economic benefits of Europe. I think those need to be better articulated, whether it isn't a straight check coming from Brussels, but rather the benefits of being part of a wider polity and economy. Um, but I still think that wouldn't work. I agree in that level. If it was only a trade relationship, then the anti-migrant rhetoric, the power rhetoric would find a home. But I think fundamentally, Irish people are comfortable that it can be both Irish and European, and these are not contradictory values. Federico, um, just on those points, you know, like Ireland's relationship with Europe, has, as uh, you know, as we spoke about there, we've, we, we, we managed to sort of maintain or create our sovereignty, aligning ourselves as, as an independent nation alongside the UK. So it wasn't a loss of sovereignty, it was a sort of a gain of sovereignty. And also we've had support around Brexit. Okay, the bailout wasn't that great, but I think people also realise the Irish government had a lot to do with that. But if the EU starts talking to us about um, um, taking more refugees, which I think they should, but um, do you think that it's easy the Irish could turn away from Europe if it feels like, well, hold on, I mean, we're not getting as much as we thought we were, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. We have to take responsibility now. I'm not too sure about that. Thanks, Shona, for, uh, for this question. And... Uh... I also want to follow up on some of the points that uh, both John and Vernon and, and Louise mentioned in, in their remarks as well. I mean, I, I, I see Brexit as a, a watershed moment uh, for the future of Europe, but I tend to uh, be of the view that, uh, you know, the departure of the United Kingdom will not be followed by future withdrawals. So Brexit will be a one-off event and we were not, we we're not going to see Article 50 be, being triggered by any of the other uh, 27 uh, member states. So in other words, uh, Europe is not on the verge of disintegration and that has to do with the fact, uh, connecting very well with the point both Vernon and, and John were making, that actually if you look around Europe, the reasons for being part of a, of a union uh, are strong everywhere and concept of sovereignty are diverse uh, the uh, economic incentives uh, might be diverse, but ultimately there's no country who thinks uh, it will be better off uh, outside the European Union rather, uh, rather than inside. But having said that, I think a second point, and that was something I was trying to, to convey in my own presentation, is that there's many ways of being within the European Union, and there's many vision of what the European Union uh, should be. Uh, and this, this conceptual distinction I've tried to outline between a polity vision of Europe, uh, which would be a more federalist type of vision, a market vision of Europe, which would be more the De Gaulle uh, intergovernmental idea that, that Vernon uh, was also embracing earlier, but then also a third autocracy vision of Europe. I think they are competing with each other. Uh, when you listen to, uh, to Orban, as John Doyle was just saying right now, he's, he loves Europe, but uh, he loves Europe as an ATM, as a mechanism that provides huge amount of money to Hungary to sustain the liberal drift that he's uh, uh, introducing at home. Uh, so he's not against Europe. He's just in favor of our Europe that supports economic growth domestically, but uh, uh, doesn't say anything about respect for values and so on. And if you look at, uh, I'll take Mark Rutte, uh, in the Netherlands, he's a great supporter of your Europe, but as a market project, uh, he doesn't like a Europe where you have lots of transfers between countries, a big MFF, uh, a general support uh, among nations. In a sense, I think the Netherlands has maybe taken up the baton of what the UK used to be. If you go back to Thatcher's famous speech uh, in Bruges, it was about a market Europe. The UK built the common market, but don't talk about polity. And then if you look at Macron, I'm just look, I'm just picking three examples, Orban, uh, uh, Orban, Rutte and Macron, uh, he has a total different vision of Europe. It's a vision about European sovereignty. He speaks openly, openly about that. And of course, you know, federalism is about dividing sovereignty. So you could have states and a union, which both are sovereign in their sphere of competencies. But uh, to wrap up on this point, I think, you know, the issue is these three visions are strongly competing at the moment uh, within Europe. And that makes the future of Europe so uncertain. So it, it's probably not going to be about this integration, but I think uh, as scholars or as thinkers, uh, we also ought to be reflecting about mechanisms whereby we can bring together this, this uh, three different vision and, and create a governance structure 
that can accommodate them. Louise, how has the, the sort of image of Europe changed where you are? Because obviously there's so much talk about it. Most of people in the North voted in favour of staying in the EU. You said that the protocol was a lifeline, but also, also people in Northern Ireland will be EU citizens because of the Good Friday Agreement. They'll have a, they have a right to an EU passport, an Irish passport. Has the feeling of being European, has that changed? Or do people feel a little bit more secure now that they have access to both? I think if you asked um, Joe Bloggs on the street, you, you know, that question, um, they would and wouldn't actually even know of the Ireland, Northern Ireland Protocol, so wouldn't even feel that safety of perhaps being an EU citizen. Um, I think to, to those individuals not in business, we are leaving the EU and we have lost, you know, perhaps for some, obviously, for the... Um, for the Remain voters, we have lost a safety net, but it's 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 been that long now that we just have to get on with it. And um, I think from a business perspective, it's you know for the first maybe two years, it was very much talking about who voted to go and who voted Remain and what how we all felt about leaving the EU and what was that going to mean and. Um, you know, maybe the arm around the shoulder is gone and suddenly we're on our own. Um, and how is that going to impact us? Northern Ireland businesses are very resilient. So after we get over the initial shock, it is just a matter of, OK, well, let's get this done. And um, I think that at the beginning, which I've alluded to, and, and you can't avoid it, the the NIROI border issue was prevalent in most of our minds because the last thing anybody wanted was for Brexit to turn political. And, you know, all the talk at the beginning of potential customs at the border, the fear was that it was going to bring us back to the bad old days. That's, I suppose, why I then, you know, referred to the Ireland NI protocol as a lifeline because it got rid of all that. It actually got rid of all that political um, noise and we were able then to just focus on business and how are we going to ensure that our businesses survive. But as I say, it's it's still, there's just so much uncertainty. Um, and even the minister, you know, talked about the Republic of Ireland and, you know, changes coming. And he referred to even individuals um, shopping online that it, it's going to change and the VAT may change and there will be customs. But we, even he doesn't know and we're the 26th of November and businesses are expected to ensure that they are compliant with the new rules on the 1st of January and that in the current climate is very overwhelming. Thanks Louise. Vernon, just on the internal markets bill, you know, uh, giving ministers the authority to disapply parts of that of the uh, Irish protocol in relation to state aid in, re in relation to goods um, that may go into the single market. Boris Johnson and his government say, A, that's there to protect the Good Friday Agreement, and B, to ensure there's no blockade of goods from GB to NI. What's your position on that? If you're asking me to defend the breach of international law on the part of the British government, you won't be successful. <laughs> uh, the agreement may be a good agreement, it may be a bad agreement, it's been signed, the ink is barely dry. This isn't the sort of thing the British government should be doing. But you see, this re relates to a larger problem, which Louise touched upon, as to why the British government has not prepared in Northern Ireland for Brexit. And the reason is, in part, the protocol, the language of the protocol is deceptive, because it implies that Northern Ireland remains in the UK customs union, but it in fact isn't. And also, Brexit has been grossly oversold, in my opinion, as a great opportunity for Britain I think one minister said we'd have all the cards and trade agreements would be very easy. Mm. It wasn't sold as a challenge. Now, the only logic of Brexit would have been for Britain to become a kind of global Singapore or Hong Kong, a free trade, fatter right country. That might have been possible before COVID. I, I doubt it, but it might have been. With COVID, where you have much more state intervention, much more public spending, that's the opposite to what a, what a fatter right Britain would need. So... These are problems which the government will have to sort out. But if you're asking me to act as a spokesman for the British government, I'd prefer not to do that, if you don't mind. 
No, no, I suppose what I wanted to know is what your, I would never ask you to do that. What is your, what is from a constitutional lawyer point of view, though, the claims made by Boris Johnson that the internal markets bill um, prevents the EU from uh, creating a blockade between G, uh, GB to NI, first of all, is that, does, it, does that, is that spoken to in the internal markets bill? Does the internal markets bill, in your view, legally protect even more the Good Friday Agreement? I suppose what I'm asking you is analyse the claims by, made by the government. Well, I can't see that the internal market bill threatens the Good Friday Agreement because, in a way, it strengthens the north-south dimension. It's true that the east-west dimension, you may say, is weakened, but I think that could be corrected in other ways. And since I've uh, so bitterly criticised the British government, perhaps I can now say something which will ensure that I shall never be invited again to an Irish forum, which is this. That the Good Friday Agreement proposes that Britain and Ireland become closer together, that the Northern Ireland problem can be solved only if they are uh, closer together. Now, Britain and Ireland can never be foreign countries in the way, for example, that Peru and Chile are foreign countries. And when Ireland left the Commonwealth in 1949, the British did not recognise it as a foreign country through the Common Travel Agreement and so on. Now, Ireland is with Burma, formerly and now Myanmar, one of the only two areas uh, ruled by Britain that is not part of the Commonwealth. The other countries whose imperial history might be terrible, perhaps almost as terrible as Ireland, nevertheless choose voluntarily to be in the Commonwealth. Now, it was a Fine Gael government in 1949 that left the Commonwealth. De Valera was a great white Commonwealth man in the 1920s, and indeed a great reformer of the Commonwealth. Indeed, his formula of external association is now the formula of the Commonwealth for republics to be in the Commonwealth. I just wonder if it might not help relations in Northern Ireland if the Irish government were to consider rejoining the Commonwealth. And as I say, that will ensure I'm never invited again to anything in the Irish Republic. Oh, I don't think so. Uh, John Doyle, that, has, that is something that um, is not under consideration, but definitely has been mooted from time to time, particularly around Brexit, because the relations have so deteriorated so badly, in essence, over the past four years. What do you think about that? You know, that Ireland, maybe even a united Ireland, could rejoin the Commonwealth? I mean, uh at, at one level, this would have been quite an emotional debate in the past. I think that, that emotional heat has gone out of it. I think now, if people were to react uh, negatively to Fernand's suggestion, it would be out of indifference rather than emotional negativity. I think they just would see, you know, what's the pros and cons of it, um, and they wouldn't see any necessary uh, positives. Uh, but I don't think that sort of just automatic, you know, some given uh, the, the British Queen some sort of even if ceremonial role related to Ireland, I think that's disappeared. One of the really interesting, from a social science perspective, when you get sort of nerdy about it, uh, outcomes of Brexit, is how in some ways it's changed the question around the future of Northern Ireland. And we see that in quite a few opinion polls now, three or four really credible, different methodologies, giving slightly different results depending on the question, the way polls do, and the timing of them. But a really significant shift not only in nationalist opinion, where you can see SDLP voters now overwhelmingly adopting a position of calling for a border, border poll and would vote yes if one was called. Whereas as late as 2015, just as Brexit was really taking off, an opinion poll a couple over that period showed the nationalist community split right down the middle on that question, with 50% of Northern nationalists being against the border poll and more or less 50% of them saying they would vote against it if somebody called it. Um, so a really sudden shift there, but an equally sudden shift in the more or less 15, 20% and growing proportion of people who don't self-define as either nationalist or unionist. And their vote on Brexit was very similar to the vote of the nationalist community. About 88% of nationalists voted against Brexit and about 78% of non-aligned voted against Brexit, whereas only 32 or 33% of unionists voted against Brexit. So there were much closer. So for that non-aligned group, who we always assumed, and every poll told us we were right, were it's like pragmatically in favour of remaining in the United Kingdom. It wasn't a big ideological issue, but it was for all sorts of reasons of history, economics, not rock the boat, fear of future violence. You know, they would have voted overwhelmingly to remain in the United Kingdom in any poll. 
And in the context of a hard Brexit, they have been split right down the middle now. So, I mean, the Lord Ashcroft poll being the one that got the biggest headlines because it showed the outcome being within the margin of error. But even the ones that still show it being slightly in favour of retaining the status quo, it's now closer than at any time in history. And it's mainly closer because of, not because any unionists changed their mind. I mean, you're talking about less than one or two percent of unionists that changed their mind about what is likely, but not about what they would personally do. But the middle ground have changed their view on that. I think that brings a lot more things into play. Uh, on a pragmatic basis, it raises the question for the Irish government about a national health system, because that's probably, for those middle ground voters, as big a question as anything else. But for some voters too, I think something like the Commonwealth and other symbolic questions um, would be important ones. I mean, I'll just finish on the point. I was at a closed door meeting about a year ago, a very senior unionist advisor in a very relaxed, you know, what if sort of debate where nobody was going to say who was there or, or quote anybody. So people over the course of a couple of days were of a residential seminar were, were you know, relatively relaxed. No and, drink. And so there was no drink taken. And But somebody posed the question to this person, you know, absolutely respect you would vote against the United Ireland. That's clearly your position. And in the past, we could have rolled out the reasons the South was poorer, the church had too much influence, it was a bit more inward looking um, than Britain as a state. How would you articulate you know, the modern version of those things we could all readily understand even if we disagreed with them? And his biggest fear is that he wouldn't be able to hold a British passport. And this was a very senior person. And the Southerners in the room just said, we couldn't imagine, well, one, it's a question for the British government rather than the Irish government as to who's entitled to hold a British passport. But we couldn't imagine any circumstances in which somebody's passport in Britain, uh, British passport in Northern Ireland would be at risk if, it, mm -hmm. if there was an agreement between the two governments to allow a border poll. Um, but yet, that really basic, so we hadn't even got as far as the Commonwealth. There's some real serious work to be done there in terms of, you know, the last thing we want is to rush into a border poll where, like Brexit referendum, nobody's any idea what the question is or what the answer might be if you voted yes or no. It was the Scottish referendum, we saw that evidence. People didn't un fundamentally vote it down because they didn't feel Scottish. They were worried about pensions and the economy and other issues. I think likewise, long in advance of any border poll, we need clarity for people. Um, and the universities can, I think, play a significant role there. And here's the consequences, make up your mind. But, but mm -hmm. you know, here's things that wouldn't happen in any circumstance. And here's things that might happen and here's things that will be likely to happen um, and bring some clarity to that. Thanks, Sir John. And Louise, just before I get to uh, Federico to, to, to close off, um, do you recognise anything that John said there? Because I suppose it's all very theoretical. As you mentioned before, people have uh, Brexit fatigue, they've COVID fatigue. And in the North, you know, those issues are actually kind of far removed from the, the emergency at the moment. Um, yeah, look, I mean, John's comments are very interesting, I think. We'd need to be in a closed room to <laughs> to be <laughs> completely honest on on all our views. Um, yeah, look, on the ground here in Northern Ireland, um, that is a bit of a mute point now, John. You're right; it 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 has been overtaken now by the Brexit and and COVID. Um, it's not. Nobody talks about whether they remain or whether they stay. Nobody talks about whether they want a border poll, poll or not. It is very much just get on with running the businesses and keeping the economy alive. Mm -hmm. um, and who knows when everything when everything calms down, maybe that will come back on the agenda. But um, I think any time it is it is mentioned, it is firmly just. The, the door is closed from a business perspective anyway. It's just um, keeping the economy alive is the priority right now. Thanks, Lisa. Federico, I'm just going to come to you to, to wrap up, but I one question I want to ask you is what we're talking about here in Brussels, and I suppose it's a real fault line for, for the EU, and this is a rule of law issue because we have Hungary and Poland holding up the EU recovery fund, the budget, over a very, very fundamental issue. Where do you see this going? Because obviously we need to see the EU lasting throughout the ages and not being held back by situations like this? What, what do you think is going to happen? I think the rule of law crisis is really becoming the biggest challenge for the Europe uh, moving forward. Uh, 
conceptually, it is possible to imagine a Europe where you have a market vision and a polity vision uh, and where you could reorganize member states along this axis where some belong to a more integrated federal core and some just participate to the economic integration part. But it's very difficult, close to impossible to accept and justify an autocracy vision of Europe. Uh, the reality where some member states no longer uh, respect the rule of law, the independence of the judiciary, separation of powers, uh, freedom of the press, academic uh, independence, uh, and so on and so forth. I think uh, this is becoming a problem that has been soaring for too long. Uh, we now see uh, that the issue has built, spilled over into budget negotiation and the future of next generation uh, EU. Uh, I think the logic of dithering and delaying dealing with the rule of law uh, crisis has reached uh, the end game. Uh, and we will see what happens in the next few weeks, but it will be crucial uh, if the uh, conditionality in the rule of law mechanism is introduced, can, that would be a big change. Can I just ask you actually, and it's relation to what Vernon had mentioned earlier, because the fact that, you know, Irish people and people in New York, they're closer to their local TDs and MPs rather than MEPs. And perhaps in Ireland, we don't know a huge amount of what has happened in Hungary, Poland, but Fine Gael is in the, is in the EPP and is kind of responsible for not reeling in uh, people like Victor Orban, but that never really gets mentioned in Ireland because there really isn't that sort of, um, you know, thought process. Is that, is that, is that a bit of a problem, like that Fine Gael could have criticism here but don't because we don't recognise them as being members of the EPP? Well, I think the EPP has a major responsibility for where we are with, uh, with Orban. Of course, the party is divided within itself, and I know Fine Gael was one of the national delegation that was in favor of suspending uh, Orban uh, from within the EPP, but so far no real action has been taken. And certainly uh, the Hungarian Prime Minister has uh, been shielded uh, by uh, the party at, at European uh, level. Uh, the council is blocked, as we know, because member states are reluctant uh, to take action uh, against uh, one another, but ultimately the council did agree with the parliament on a, a mm. rule of law conditionality mechanism. Uh, and if that enters into force, I think it might uh, eventually bring uh, some change. But we are at crunch moment. There's no doubt about that. OK, well, listen, thank you so much for that, Federico. And uh, to Louise Kelly, to John Doyle, to Vernon Bogdaner, and earlier to Thomas Byrne, Minister for EU Affairs, and Professor Dara Kyo. Thank you very much to everyone for listening to us for the past hour and a half. For me, Shona Murray, um, we we'll hope to see you soon. And I thank you, Shana, for moderating. I'll, I'll just say a couple of words to thank on, also on my side, everyone for participating and attending. I just would like to remind uh, people that the Brexit Institute will be back in just over a couple of weeks uh, with an event uh, uh, organized with and hosted by the European Central Bank on post-pandemic uh, recovery. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you there. And for those who are celebrating Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving. Thank mm -hmm. you very much to everyone. Thank you.